Um, that includes, you know, photos, newspapers, physical artifacts, all kinds of things. Um, so that's basically what I'm responsible for here. Um, uh, I grew up, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, so that's where I grew up. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in history and anthropology, and then I have a master's degree in public history. Um, and I've been working in the museum field um, kind of more generally for over a decade now, um, which I realized that when I was writing up the little bio for this presentation, and I'm really not sure where all that time went, but um, during the past decade, um, I picked up some tips and tricks um, for handling, storing, and preserving artifacts that can transfer from a museum professional setting um, to your home collections as well. Um, so that's the basis of this program and what I'll be discussing today. Um, kind of the general format will be, I'm gonna talk about some overarching ideas that apply to all artifacts. Um, and then I'll kind of break down into different artifact groups kind of more specifically and how you can handle those. <clears throat> um, I do have a PowerPoint presentation that I'll pull up here in a second to make it a little more visually appealing um, for everybody. And um, I just want to reiterate, like Michaela said, if you do have any questions as I'm going along or if something's not making sense to you, you can just hit the raise hand button and she'll unmute you so that you can ask the question. Um, you're also welcome to wait. We'll have some time at the end to ask questions as well, um, if you're more comfortable doing that. And then um, I also wanted to say, uh, talking about home collections can be a little weird. You know, if you have something super specific or you don't want to talk about you know, your specific stuff in this setting, um, you're more than welcome to email us at the museum. Um, my personal email is jmichak at estes.org. Um, that's J-M-I-C-H-A-K at estes.org. And we can kind of answer questions and try to help you out. We have a lot of people that reach out that way. So um, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, if you just give me one second, I will figure out how to get this PowerPoint started for everyone. Um, Michaela, is that working? Can you see the? Yes, that looks great on my end. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, so first and foremost, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what constitutes an at-home collection um, or basically family heirlooms. Um, an heirloom would be considered, um, traditionally considered as something that is valued valuable to your fam specific family history, um, and that's belonged to a family for several generations. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people keep like scrapbooks or photo albums, um, military memorabilia, historic clothing, flags. Um, basically, an heirloom is anything that's valuable to your specific family's history um, and that you would be keeping for that reason. Um, what people often overlook might be items that are valuable to um, like your personal history in the present that might become an heirloom in the future. Um, so a lot of times as we're going, going about our lives, we're not really thinking about, you know, the things that we're creating now that might be valuable for future generations. Um, so it's always a good idea to keep in mind that value because you know, the earlier you identify something like that, um, the faster you can start doing some like initial um, preservation practices to those items. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of what people collect and what they should be collecting, that's definitely a very tricky area. Um, it can be pretty subjective. Um, we've run across a lot of people that um, ask the museum, you know, as they go through their belongings, what should we keep? What might have value? Um, we've also encountered some folks that like, um, what you think is important, maybe your children or grandchildren don't want the responsibility of caring for into the future. Um, so it's definitely kind of a tricky area and you kind of have to make those determinations as a family. Um, and try not to get overwhelmed because it can be overwhelming. Um, my advice in regards to picking and choosing and making those considerations, um, is to really try to look for 
um, unique items, like items that would tell a compelling story um, and try to give special significance to items that connect your family to a larger shared cultural history, um, whether that's like local or national. <clears throat> um, but basically like what is unique to your family history, not things that you can find elsewhere that aren't specific to you. Um, so moving forward a little bit, um, we'll talk about the major considerations for storing items. Um, this is largely centered around having a controlled environment for anything that you're storing at home. Um, so the factors that contribute to a controlled environment include physical location, um, light, temperature and humidity control, and basic security. Um, so breaking those factors down, um, first you would want to think about the physical location that in your home that you're going to store your items in. Um, so more often than not, um, family heirlooms or items are, you know, there's th things that we're not using on a day to day basis, um, which on one hand is really good for the artifact, because if you're not handling it every day, you're not contributing more to it breaking down. Um, but on the other hand, what happens with things that you're not using every day, you kind of shove them wherever you have extra space. Um, and a lot of times that winds up being uh, like the attic or the garage or a basement. Um, and typically those aren't the best areas um, for storage. Uh, typically those areas, you know, they lack temperature and humidity control. Um, they might be more prone to pests. Um, and essentially the best place to store your family heirlooms is in a cool, dry place with a stable temperature and um, humidity. So for instance, um, if your garage is say where kind of all your extra stuff winds up and um, it's not insulated, that means, you know, in the winter, it's getting very, very cold. And in the summer, it's getting very, very hot. And so those big fluctuations in temperature can really affect um, your artifacts and make them break down faster. Um, <clears throat> so actually, um, pretty recently, well, up until pretty recently, that was also an issue here at the museum. Um, we, our former collection storage uh, facility was in a warehouse that was across town um, and it was not temperature or humidity controlled and it was vulnerable to dirt and pests. Um, if you can look at my slide here on the, the left side is an overview of the, the warehouse. So you can kind of see some of the issues that we had with it. Um, <clears throat> and our staff here at the museum recognized that as a problem years ago. Um, it was well before I started. And then during my time, we, we did um, a collection storage move to a better environment. So on the right here is some volunteers cleaning um, inside our newer storage <laughs> facility. Um, and we keep this now to um, that controlled environment. You know, it's, there's no dirt, there's no uh, pests, it's more secure. Um, and then in terms of controlling our temperature and humidity, uh, we're able to do that. We try to do um, a temperature range of uh, 60 degrees with a 40% humidity, um, give or take a couple degrees. And that's what we recommend trying to replicate um, at your home in whatever storage solution you're able to do. Um, and we also store, that's for most artifacts, we would recommend storing um, photos and negatives at a little bit, a couple degrees cooler than that. Um, that just kind of helps those specifically. Um, here at the museum too, we also have a specialized um, environmental monitoring system in place. Um, so for home use, um, the best advice we can give like, is simply choosing a spot in your house where you can control the temperature. Um, and then figuring out the humidity in your home environment might be a little bit more difficult. Um, <clears throat> but generally, if you're feeling it's too humid in the room, it's probably too humid for your artifacts as well. So just kind of base that off, you know, what you're feeling. Um, so just to reiterate quickly, the best practice is to 
um, is to avoid wide fluctuations in temperature and humidity. Um, ideally, we would suggest storing your heirlooms um, in a central location in your house, um, either a closet or a room um, that's devoid of vents or pipes. And then we also recommend storing items um, at least six inches off the ground. Um, we do that in case there's any unexpected flooding, which can happen in a basement or you know areas of your house. Um, so those are just some things to be aware of. Um, <clears throat> another consideration that people often forget in when they're storing things in the home environment is access to light. So light is actually super damaging for artifacts. Um, so storing them in a dark environment is definitely a good tip. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, you know, um, throw your heirlooms in a box and never get them out in the light and look at them or anything like that. Um, but it just means, you know, the less light exposure they have, the better in the long run. <clears throat> um, moving forward, um, much like our museum collections, our home collections are often unintentionally exposed to what we call agents of deterioration. Um, these agents can effectively destroy the historical integrity of artifacts. Um, and then that in turn decreases its physical and intellectual value. Um, so I will go through these agents um, kind of more specifically as we go through here, depending on each object. But the big ones to kind of look out for is um, mold and mildew, um, general wear and improper or overhandling. Um, so you know, if you have um, a very historic item and you're kind of just tossing it around, you want to avoid that. Um, and then pests can be a super big um, <clears throat> thing that causes wear as well. Um, okay, so that was kind of some general tips. So now we're going to break down um, <clears throat> and talk about these more specific things. Um, the first I'll talk about is paper deterioration. Um, so this is, would be for your photographs and your archival items, uh, which are, um, I'm probably gonna spend the most time on this because honestly, this is what we get asked about most here at the museum. Um, and this is pretty common as for what people wind up keeping at home. It's usually a lot of um, scrapbooks and photo albums and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> So a good rule of thumb um, in storing these types of materials is to keep similar items stored together um, as opposed to having just one box that has everything all mixed in together. Um, you still have to be a little bit careful of this, you know, because if you have, you know, say your grandmother, your grandmother's letter and a photograph that goes with that letter, you would want, obviously want to keep those together for the intellectual connection there. Um, but if you just have stuff that doesn't really relate to one another, all intermingled in a box, that is the type of stuff that you would try to separate out and store together. So like photos with photos, letters with letters, um, so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, and the reason that we do that is basically all these materials are made up of different things and different chemicals and mixing those all together can cause the other one to break down even faster. Um, and then also we do that because if you have one thing that starts breaking down, um, you know, if something starts becoming discolored or has wear or stains or anything like that, it can pretty quickly transfer to other materials around it. <clears throat> um, so because paper materials are often highly acidic, um, we recommend um, handling them with white cotton gloves, or we also use these nitrile gloves. So in the picture on the left here, um, these are some of our volunteers working with nitrile gloves on. Um, and the reason that we do that is the oils that are in your skin, they actually have a detrimental effect on paper format materials um, and actually other artifacts as well. Um, now, uh, in your home life, you might not just, you might just not have, <laughs> you know, gloves like this available. Um, 
So if, if that's not an option for you, you don't have those kind of materials at home, um, definitely wash your hands with soap and dry them before you handle your photographs or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> and that should help mitigate some of the oils that would come off of your skin. Um, we also recommend if you're looking for like home storage solutions, um, we recommend using acid-free paper, boxes, tissues, um, folders, and photo sleeves whenever possible. Um, that will prevent any reactions and deterioration over time. Um, so that's our recommendation, like the gold standard. Unfortunately, that's not an option for a lot of people because um, these items are super costly. Uh, we actually have to be pretty careful about what we're ordering here at the museum. Um, just to kind of stay within our budgets as well and also, you know, preserve these to the highest professional standard that we can. Um, that professional grade storage really can add up. So it kind of depends on the size of your collection and, and how you want to go about it. Um, in my opinion, the initial cost of these higher quality supplies winds up being worth it in the long run because, you know, you're trying to preserve these things for several generations. Um, but <clears throat> That's kind of a personal choice for everyone to make. Um, if you do need a cheaper option, um, you can use like regular non-acid free boxes and things like that. Um, I would still recommend trying to get acid free tissue paper or um, some separation in between there. Um, for storage of photos and archival materials, um, we recommend flat storage um, wherever po possible with um, some kind of material separation between the items. Um, in an ideal setting, like each individual photograph would have its own individual sleeve. Um, and some cheaper options for that, if you can't, you know, um, get the photo sleeves or anything like that, um, they also make these things called plastines, which are like little plastic covers, but the plastic is supposed to be um, a safer kind of plastic and it's not supposed to off gas. Um, and those are relatively inexpensive. Um, and another way to do this as well, um, if all the acid-free stuff isn't an option, is you could um, get a ream of acid-free paper, which is pretty inexpensive, or regular paper, you know, as well. Um, and then you could either use that paper to, to fold into individual sleeves or place as a layer between items. Um, <clears throat> And then finally, like another little hack for the photo sleeves, if you're making your own, if you're purchasing, um, this probably seems very obvious, but you'd be surprised, um, is to make sure to label the outside of the photo sleeve or um, separation with a description of what's inside. Um, that way you can read in the pencil on the top what it is instead of having to pull photos in and out of sleeves um, to determine what's in there. <clears throat> um, and then <clears throat> um, with storage of any kind, so any kind of boxes that you're using, um, you want to be aware of the shape and size of your storage container. So if the box you're storing items in is too large, things can move around within it and, and um, cause damage. And then um, on the other side of that, um, if a box is too full, that can also cause damage to the items inside it. So you want to make sure um, with any box that you're filling that you can fit your hand fully inside. And if you can't, um, that's too much. <clears throat> okay, so um, one of the more common questions we get asked here is about newspaper. Um, Newspapers are one of the most highly acidic um, items kept and passed down by families. So like it, in the museum and archival field, we love newspapers and all the information in them, but the actual physical newspaper we're not a fan of. Um, it just breaks down so quickly. Um, you know, if you kind of think about it, newspapers are created and intended to be disposable. And that's why um, they're highly acidic, they break down super quickly. I'm sure you guys have had an old newspaper for a couple months and you notice it's yellowing right away. Um, that's kind of the 
the breakdown of the actual paper. Um, it just de degenerates very quickly. Um, <clears throat> that's why a lot of these people, um, or a lot of museum, museums, I should say, um, are making it a priority to um, digitize or transfer to microfilm um, their newspaper collections. Um, we are also actually, we're currently working on that here at the museum as well. Um, <clears throat> we, not only as a preservation method, but also to make that information more accessible and searchable to researchers. Um, currently we have from 1913 to 1965, um, digitized and searchable on Colorado historic newspapers. And then we are expected to add more years um, until we're kind of caught up. Um, so make sure to check that out if you're doing any family research. Um, if you personally have newspaper format items at home um, that are important to you and your family's history, uh, we recommend either photocopying um, those onto acid-free paper or storing those in an archivally safe plastic or an acid-free folder. Um, that's what we would suggest. Um, in either scenario, um, I would say it's pretty important to separate the newspaper the, or the, yeah, like the newsprint out um, because that is one of the things that will break down the fastest. <clears throat> and it will also leach onto other materials that it's near. <clears throat> um, in thinking about storage um, of paper materials, some common things to avoid would be uh, glue, paste, tape, um, adhesives of any kind that can adversely affect um, these items in the long term. Uh, I know a lot of people um, scrapbook or keep photo albums. And if that's something that interests you, we would simply recommend avoiding um, any of the adhesive that adheres directly to your photos or documents. Um, I know they make photo corners and photo mounts um, that adhere to the page, and then you just slide your photo into it. So that is an option. Um, for photo albums, uh, just trying to ensure that any plastic coverings are archivally safe as well is a good, good idea. Um, another good rule of thumb is that if you are putting um, an or original irreplaceable item into your photo album or scrapbook, you want to be certain that you're not doing anything that cannot be undone to that item. You know, so if you're gluing your original photo to a backing, that's not, um, that's not recommended. <clears throat> um, Metal fasteners and bindings of any kind should be avoided. Um, they rust and det deteriorate pretty quickly. Um, and then that also will leach onto your paper or your photos. Um, rubber bands, I really hate rubber bands. <laughs> um, they are only made temporarily. They really um, are not intended for long-term storage. And I feel like anyone who's worked in a museum has probably spent some time trying to scrape some gummed up adhered rubber bands off paper before. <laughs> um, so a popular alternative to metal fasteners and rubber bands are these plastic clips um, that you can purchase and they, they're pretty inexpensive and they come in multiple sizes and they kind of work in the same way as um, you know, like a paper clip or a staple, but they are uh, plastic and they will not harm your documents. <clears throat> um, negatives can be stored in a similar manner, uh, kind of depending on their size. Um, negatives and photos are particularly sensitive to light. Um, <clears throat> so it's very important to keep them stored in a dark place. Um, if you're planning to frame or display a historic photograph, it might be in your best interest to display a copy because of um, the light damage. Well, the light can damage or fade the photograph over time. Um, this is also would be true about artwork. Um, if you have artwork on display in the home, um, obviously you can't replicate that or make a copy and hang it, but um, you might want to consider its location in the house and if it's in direct sunlight or not and um, moving things around so that you know, the art isn't 
um, continually exposed to light. <clears throat> um, if you choose to frame a photograph, an original photograph or document, um, I, we recommend using ultraviolet filtering glass that will just kind of help um, mitigate some of that light damage. And then we also recommend using spacer so that the photograph does not become adhered to the glass um, of the actual frame. Um, <clears throat> one important thing to consider with historic items is that they become virtually unusable without the historical context and the information that surrounds them. Um, so it's always important to document, you know, um, the location a photograph was taken, the date, any individuals present, you know, the, the event, if there is one. Um, we actually have just ran into this um, with, in my family, um, my great aunt Helen had some scrapbooks and by the time, you know, she passed away and then by the time our family kind of got together to go through them, um, many of the people in them we weren't able to identify anymore we weren't able to identify you know like the trips that she took or just a lot of that um, connecting information had been lost um, so that's something to think about um, in the future you know it seems obvious like of course I know that this is this person doing this thing but that really gets lost pretty quickly from especially from generation to gen generation um, we recommend keeping that information together with your photographs, um, possibly on a separate sheet of paper. Um, if you're choosing to write on the back of your photographs, they actually make special like pencils that are able to do that. So you can write directly on there. <clears throat> um, with all your photos, negatives, and slides, um, it's our recommendation to scan those to a digital format if you haven't done so yet. Um, we've had some folks contact us here that actually took, you know, um, took time during COVID and all the restrictions from that to get organized and start scanning things and prepping things for the future in that way. Um, <clears throat> but it's always essentially good to have a digital backup um, in case anything should happen to your original. Um, I also want to touch really quickly on digital born records. Um, so increasingly more and more materials um, are created digitally rather than physically. Um, so, you know, on your camera when you're taking photos, that's creating a digital file. Um, <clears throat> storage of those digital rec records, um, that can be kind of a complex issue. Our best advice for that is to keep multiple backups of any scans that you have. You would want to keep those backups in separate places in case something happened. Um, and then another thing to consider that kind of gets overlooked is that you'll want to um, <clears throat> continually transfer that digital media to new formats as, you know, kind of aligning with computer um, hardware and software technology. So you want to keep upgrading as things are created. Um, we've seen multiple forms of technology become obsolete. You know, I've seen that within my lifetime um, and, and they become unusable, unusable as time progresses. Um, so just kind of keep that in the back of your mind and be aware of that. <laughs> um, so I am gonna move on from um, paper-based materials and start talking about more physical artifacts, uh, beginning with textiles. And I'll try to move through the rest of these um, kind of quickly um, because I don't want to be, you know, too redundant, um, but just kind of try to remember that you would approach the storage and care of physical artifacts in, this, in a similar way um, as you would to photographs and archives. Um, so essentially you would want that stable environment. You want to be selective about the boxes that you're picking. You want to isolate items that of the same material and, and those types of things. You're still would be doing that for all the artifacts that we will talk about as well. Um, <clears throat> so for textiles, um, first and foremost, you want to figure out what material type you have. Um, your natural fibers which is a lot of what like historic clothing would be made of. Um, 
those are going to break down faster than your synthetics. Um, so again, you'd want to isolate those material types and store those together to the best of your ability. Um, so for instance, if you have um, like leather shoes, you wouldn't want to put that with a cotton dress in the same box um, without a separation or anything like that. So you're still trying to isolate those things. Um, <clears throat> moving into the agents of deterioration that specifically affect textiles. Um, the environment and temperature, again, those are something that you want to control. Um, one thing that affects textiles more, more often is pollution. Um, so if you're in a smoking household or um, <clears throat> most recently here in SS um, with the wildfires, you know, there's a lot of smoke in the air seeping into people's houses and into their um, collections and their own closets and everything like that. Um, <clears throat> and those historic textiles really kind of soak up that smoke and things like that. Um, and granted, some of that is out of your control. You know, you really can't affect the wildfire <laughs> outside and, you know, there's not really a way to predict and prevent that. Um, but what you can do is consider um, you know, if you do have any items that have smoke damage or anything like that, you can consider um, letting them air out um, inside your home, just kind of letting them air out, and then uh, potentially replacing the storage materials um, for them. <clears throat> uh, so overhandling um, of textiles is another issue that leads to wear on fabrics. Um, mold and mildew is something that affects textiles um, more often. Um, mold <clears throat> is a little bit of a tricky area as well. Um, you treat mold differently depending on whether it's active or inactive. Um, we actually came across this recently here at the museum. We had several, um, I think it was three of our leather saddles that we had in the collection that had an active mold growth on them. Um, so what we had to do was um, basically dry it out and air it out um, for in a couple of cycles. And then um, what we're doing in this picture here on the left is um, vacuum cleaning it. So there's a brush and a screen. So you're vacuuming the mold up that you're brushing off through the screen uh, for <laughs> For that. So it's, it's actually a little weird and complicated. Um, if you, you have an issue such as mold at home, um, you definitely want to be super, super careful with that. And probably like more often than not, you would consult a professional about it because um, the mold spores can be really harmful if you're, um, if you were to breathe them in. That's why we're um, cleaning the saddle in an outdoor environment, why we have masks on. Um, uh, if you were to find mold in any of your home collections, that's also a good opportunity to re-examine the storage environment because um, theoretically, if you're following all the best practices for storage, you shouldn't have an environment um, that's conducive to, grow, to mold growth. Um, but having said that, <laughs> sometimes just these older, you know, materials, they are simply more susceptible to things like that. So it might not necessarily be you know, something that you did or caused or anything like that. It, it could just be, you know, the nature of the, the actual material. <clears throat> um, some common pests that affect specifically textiles are the carpet beetle, the case making clothes moth, and the webbing clothes moth. Um, we treat infestations um, for each of these a slightly differently, um, but essentially what we would do here at the museum is wrap the materials in plastic and then you take them through freezing cycles and that should kill off any pests um, without actually damaging the materials. Um, and then we kind of follow that up, you know, once it's through the freezing cycles um, by mitigating that with um, cleaning. Uh, <clears throat> And it's also possible that you might you might need some conservation depending on how bad the outbreak, I guess, would be. Um, these type of pests would be, um, in in my opinion, they're they're kind of uncommon in the home environment. Um, just to make sure 
you would just want to make sure you're routinely checking your environment um, and hopefully catching that before it gets, gets bad. Um, other pests such as mice or vermin, those can be a potential issue for um, uh, textiles, but also uh, paper format materials. Typically they're gonna wanna, like the mice would want to um, either nest inside those materials or they would chew them up and use them for nesting. Like they're not really eating or getting any sustenance from that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> but they will use it, you know, to make themselves more comfortable. <laughs> um, again, with that, you would probably notice a mice infestation in your home if you had anything like that. Um, and then just kind of keep an eye on your storage, you know, accordingly if, if that were to happen. <clears throat> um, for actual textile storage, there's a few different options. Um, if you choose to hang historic textiles, we recommend using a padded hanger. Um, here at the museum, this is a photograph of one of our interior cabinets here. And um, as you can see, we're just using um, covered hangers. Um, I believe that it's a muslin wrapped hanger. <clears throat> um, some garments, depending on their wear, uh, or their seams, it might not be the best idea to hang them. Uh, so if we have something of that nature, we typically um, uh, store them flat. Um, another option for oversized textiles would be rolled storage. <clears throat> um, so if you have like a f like flags or quilts would be a good option for rolled storage. Um, and when you're doing that, you can roll and then interweave um, like a like a muslin wrapping or an acid-free tissue paper so that the material isn't um, rolling over on itself and there's still that um, separation there. <clears throat> um, if you're planning to box any textiles, you want that separation still and then if you have something that's oversized for the box and you would have to fold it, what you can do is pad out the folds. So essentially you don't want any really harsh folds. You want to kind of like roll them over. So it's like spreading the wear out um, over the entire roll rather than that really harsh like fold. <clears throat> um, moving on to metallic artifacts. Um, Again, your first step, kind of similarly, is you would want to figure out what the composition of the metals is. Because <clears throat> they all um, they all break down in different ways. So isolating them and storing similar metals together, again, is your best bet. Um, <clears throat> if you have a metal that's in an active breakdown situation, there's not much you can do to um, stop that. Um, that's actually something interesting that a lot of people don't know about artifacts in general um, is that, you know, in any given collection, we can't um, entirely stop a material from breaking down over time. Like we, we're not capable of doing that. What we're actually trying to do is just provide the best environment for delaying that process as long as possible. But, you know, essentially things will be breaking down, you know, regardless. <laughs> um, Next up, we'll talk about composite artifacts. Um, so this is basically any artifact that has multiple materials used in its construction. Um, for any um, preservation or storage at home, my suggestion is to um, examine the artifact. Um, I would make a list of every material present and try to determine what percentage of the overall construction that material is. You know, so if you have um, a wood and a metal sign, how much is, you know, is it 60% wood, 40% metal? Um, how's that kind of breakdown there? Um, <clears throat> once you make that um, determination, you can kind of then examine um, which material is the most vulnerable. So you're going to be looking at you know, is one actively breaking down? Is one breaking down and affecting the other? Um, and then you kind of treat the one that's um, basically the 
the squeakiest wheel gets the grease in terms of <laughs> composite artifacts. So um, you would treat those accordingly. Um, <clears throat> I would say for composite artifacts, you know, if you've got something that's in an active breakdown state, you might want to consult um, a professional and possibly consider doing some conservation, depending on the, you know, the, the specific item and how valuable it is to your family's specific history. Um, lastly, I will chat really quickly about cleaning artifacts. Um, that's something we um, had to do in bulk after our collections move here, and then we will continue that process annually um, <clears throat> here at the museum. That doesn't probably does not need to happen um, as frequently at it with a home collection. Um, it kind of depends on how um, dirty your items are, or how how vulnerable I guess they are would be to um, dirt or dust. Um, <clears throat> So if you've never cleaned an artifact, you know, say you have something from your great grandmother and nobody's ever cleaned it and it's kind of collected some some grime and dust over over the years. Um, a lot of times people just want to go full out and get it sparkling clean. Um, and you just have to be really, really careful um, in that regard. You don't want to use any household cleaners on any historic artifacts. Um, we here at the museum, um, <clears throat> Typically, there's a lot of materials that you can't even get wet, you know, so like historic textiles or anything like that, you wouldn't want to throw those into the washing machine and then dry them. That would, you know, <laughs> be very detrimental for um, their physical structure. Um, so what we do typically with dirty textiles is we will vacuum them with a screen so that the actual vacuum is not causing a lot of pressure or wear on the textile itself. Um, but that way you're still kind of getting that layer you know, the exterior layer of dust and, and grime on. Um, <clears throat> you would also, with any wood or metal materials, um, if they have like a layer of paint on them, you'd want to be careful getting anything wet because it could take the paint off or, you know, if a metal is in an active rust situation that could contribute to it. Um, so just kind of be careful when you're cleaning. Um, I would say start with a dry, soft rag and well, you'd be surprised how much you can get done with that, you know, without having to go any further. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I am gonna wrap up there and um, if we have any questions, um, we can definitely talk about them. Let me figure out how to stop sharing my screen here. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks so much, Jess. So yeah, now's the time for questions. If anybody has any questions um, for Jessica specifically, hit that raise hand button. Yep. Okay, we've got a couple. Here we go. Um, David, let me see. There we go. This is Francis, Dave's wife. Hi, Francis. Hi. So on the wood item, I have an armoire made of mahogany and it spent probably about the last 170 years in either Virginia or Louisiana. Now that it's here in Colorado, it's shrinking. I mean, I can see the parts kind of coming apart because it's dry. Is there any way to treat the wood or the only way would be to add a humidifier to the house? Um. I think that would that would be my first suggestion is try to figure out the humidity and what's going on there. I think we are, if I'm not mistaken, in a less humid environment though. Oh, much less, yes. Right, correct. So I, I'm surprised that it's reacting that way, I guess. I would think it would be well, more, but that that's probably you probably hit the nail on the head is try to figure out the um, the actual humidity of your environment and then um, try to mitigate that and take the humidity. But, make adjustments but, to the humidity but there's nothing like i mean for for hands we can put hand cream on there's nothing like that for wood is there um there is there is something um that they sell it's called renaissance wax that you potentially i don't think it would have changed like what's currently happening it sounds like it's like constricting i don't think it would reverse that but it could potentially help in that way, but 
Okay. I'd have to maybe research that a little bit more, but it, there's no like direct comparison, I don't think. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, yeah. Rosa. All right. We've got another question from um, Bobby Heisterkamp. Bobby. All right. Let's see. Hi. I, I have um, a massive postcard collection, which I am not too concerned about because I keep them in archival sleeves, uh, archival folders. But I do have some ephemeral stuff, like old letters from um, lodge owners and some, some wonderful, and they're, they're kind of uh, fragile. So what I usually do is put them in a sheet protector and keep them in albums. Do you think I'm doing the right thing? Um, I would say for a home solution, that's that's probably fine. I would try to check if your um, the constitution of the actual plastic sleeve, because some of those plastics can off gas and that could affect the letters. Um, you're probably probably okay though. Um, it just kind of depends on specifically the type that you're using. My, my biggest thing is that I want to share these with people and often people come and look at my artifacts or look at my postcards and then ask if they can use them for, um, for something, some project they're doing and they're handling them. And I always think if they're, it's okay if they're handling them because they're in a sheet, they're mm -hmm. in a protector. Uh, that's, that's where I start started doing that and also it keeps the very fragile paper from letters from mm -hmm. getting folded again I know I know better than to fold uh it, that's the worst <laughs> thing you can do I keep them yeah. flat so um I I'm think just... in terms of if you <laughs> okay. have people so that... actively using your collection it is better to have them in the plastic sleeve like you're doing um because like I said the oils in your hands can really affect the paper and if the over handling uh, you know if they're touching the actual physical thing that's not great so so taking that step and putting them in the plastic so that you can handle the plastic as opposed to the actual physical letter is probably probably really great yeah <laughs> that's what we would we would say <laughs> okay thank you thank yeah. you <laughs> all right thanks so much Bobby um we've got a, a couple of other questions um, Lynn, I'm gonna, let's see. Oops, sorry. All right, Lynn, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, perfect. Uh, my question is, would you please repeat the email? I have Jay uh, Mishak, but I don't know what the rest of that email address was. Yeah, uh, sorry, it's uh, J-M-I-C-H-A-K. And that's and at estes.org. Thank you. Yeah, and you can also find any of us on the website as well. So if you if you lose it again or anything. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, we've got another question from uh, Cindy Bugs. Cindy, just a sec. Let me get you on here. Oops. All right, Cindy, are you there? I am. Okay, perfect. It's good to see you girls. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. I have got a uh, assortment of like life magazines from the early 40s, the late 30s, and some even earlier from, I guess, even the 20s, but also some a, a big collection of World War II uh, letters that were written by soldiers to my mother, who was a pinup girl. And I'm wondering, the letters have held up terrific in just this shoebox. I mean, oh. it's, it's amazing. I mean, they're just like they had been received yesterday. Um, but I'm concerned about the, um, the magazines. I'd like to keep them, you know, I know in antique stores, you see them sealed in, you know, mm -hmm. plastic or whatever. What would you say, Jessica, would be the best, best way for us to, you know, keep these in good shape? Because people do want to look at them. So, you know. <laughs> um, 
I would say it kind of depends. You have a couple options. You could do the sleeves um, like you had thought or suggested. Um, if you're gonna be handling them a lot and you wanna, you know, like that flexibility to be able to pull them in and out of a box or anything like that, um, getting like an acid-free tissue paper or an, like reams of acid-free paper that you can put those inserts in between them um, just so that they're not kind of like stacked in together. Um, basically yeah. you want you want that physical separation that'll that'll help preserve them in the long run. Um, okay. And then, like I said, if you're if you're gonna handle them, also either wash your hands and dry them first, or um, get those white cotton gloves or the nitrile gloves mm -hmm. for any time you would handle them. It's kind of like just coming into the museum. If you, you know, if we were to pull a magazine that's from the collection, the, the researcher would have to wear gloves. Um, right. So. It, might seem kind of nuts, but replicating yeah. that environment in your house uh, will help preserve those items. Okay, great. Yeah. Good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Cindy. Uh -huh. All right. Next, we've got um, a question from Bob. Bob Levitt. Hi, Bob. Hello. Can you, can you, hi, hi, Jessica. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I inherited a coin collection from my grandfather okay. and uh, all, uh, coins and paper money, uh, all kinds of different uh, money. Anyway, suggestions for, you know, preserving that properly. Um. <clears throat> I would suggest kind of like what Bobby has going on with the postcards is getting like an individual um, higher quality plastic um, sleeve for each one. So you don't want to just have them like in a box all intermingled together because that's where your metal is going to start breaking down. So if it's kind of like isolated by itself, that's probably the best option for storing those. Um, I've seen, I think the there's a lot of coin collectors out there and they have a lot of good good methods for for kind of like storing those in a way that you can also display them in those binders and things like that so you could consider that as well if you haven't already <laughs> yeah some are some are stored probably that way others have maybe pieces of paper between them in a little cigar sleeve and i, I probably need oh, to work yeah. on those uh, because the paper is not uh like you said acid free mm -hmm. so that could be a definite pro problem Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah. And uh, I'll just have to look into that some more. Yeah. And also try to put, you know, if they're made of different metals, try to put those together. If you, if you can, if it makes sense for your collection intellectually, try to do that. Okay. And paper money too is like falling apart, you know? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So I suppose it's like any other paper product to try to protect, just acid free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that would that would be what I would recommend. Yeah, um, the, with, with the money, you could also do the probably the same little plastic sleeves that they do for the postcards. A lot okay. Of stuff will fit in there as well, and those are relatively inexpensive, so that shouldn't be. Super yeah, hard. well, some of some of mine are in cards. You know, they have these cards where you press the coin into the the holder. Right. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. And I don't know if I like that or not because I'm not sure what's going on behind the card. You know, in the in the slot behind the card. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah. I will work on that. Yeah, <laughs> that's what's fun about personal collections is you can kind of, here's what the gold standard is and like, how can I make this work for me? So yeah, it's yeah, a lot of flexibility. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. All right, I think, I think that's everybody. If anybody else has another question, please hit that raise hand um, button. And if not, um, like Jessica said, oop, we've got one more from Judy. Hold on just a sec. Hi, Judy. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> All right, Judy, are you there? Am I unmuted now? You are. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sorry, that was probably I, I my was fault. Gonna... I was going to jump in with some of the things that that I have ordered many years ago, and I I went and grabbed my iPad so I could look up one. One was 20th century plastics that I got lots and lots of iCarvel or I'm sorry archival 
uh, pages, different sizes for, uh, as Bobby said, for postcards, uh, other size of, of paper items and everything else. Unfortunately, I looked up and it says that they're permanently closed. Um, but an another company that I have dealt with with some products is called Light Impressions. And, uh, you know, again, some of the things are expensive. Some of the sheets that I was looking up were like a package of 10 for $13. So that's about $1.30 a, a page protector, but that's a full size, you know, eight and a half by 10 or 11. Um, but anyway, so I have had have had experience with that company and have never been, <clears throat> haven't ordered anything recently, but I have yep, <clears throat> always gotten good quality, good service. Um, and unless they've gone downhill in the last few years, I could recommend them that they they are good to deal with. And if you go on their website, they've got ar archival storage for everything. And even one of the things that I went, you know, happened to hit on was some things for coins also. So um, check those sites out. We, yeah, we also, I've heard of that one. Um, we also, Hello, Frank. we wind up using um, Gaylord a lot. Um, Uline has some products that are archivally safe, um, but there's a couple of different ones out there. Um, yeah. So if you need any recommendations, anyone could, could email and we can send them to you as well. Um, when ordering stuff, uh, my advice to you is to kind of figure out how much you think you're gonna need first because that can help you <laughs> yeah. for sure <clears throat> and the sizes and stuff so yeah you may it's something you may have to budget you know to order mm -hmm. a few things at a time and and protect part of your collection and then as as you can afford things um you know if you can't have your entire wish list then mm -hmm. you know make another order later you gotta yeah. start somewhere yeah <laughs> that's a great idea <laughs> Yeah, that's some good advice. Thanks, Judy, and thanks for that um, company recommendation. Mm -hmm. All right, gang. Well, if there are no other questions, like Jessica said, you can always reach us um, over email. It's probably the quickest way to get to us. And um, all of our contact information, including mine, is on our website. Um, so feel free to drop us a message if you have any further questions or if something comes up um, as you're evaluating your at-home collection. <laughs> Um, but I and think with I should say we love this stuff. So like, don't feel bad if you want to ask a question. You're not bothering us. Like this is, I love it. <laughs> this is what we do. Not yeah. <laughs> what you do. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, Jess, do you have anything else you want to add? No, but I just want to say thank you again to everyone for coming. Yeah, absolutely. And to um, this video will be posted on YouTube later. So if you need to go back and um, kind of. Uh, see a different specific material type or anything like that um, with Jess's recommendations. Um, this should be posted to YouTube by next week. Um, so with that, I think we'll end our webinar there. And thank you so much for coming, everybody. Have yeah. a lovely weekend. <laughs>